Thank you, Stephen. It's good to be here. Um, I'm going to follow a um, PowerPoint here. Starting with this very scary um, opening image of what looks like our planet on fire, um, <clears throat> which it um, kind of is right now, with at least one of many um, outcomes being that we have unleashed a plague of ticks and the diseases that they carry. So what I'm going to do is talk about the threat posed by ticks, but in two parts. First, you're going to hear how we um, abetted this. We had a great hand in making this happen. This is humankind's doing, what we've done to the planet. Then you're going to hear how we've responded to it. <laughs> and we have not responded well. We have not managed this illness well. We have not worked assiduously enough to control ticks. And we are paying a great price. Many people, many patients are paying a great price. So um, when I um, was finishing up my book, I asked several people to um, look at it and maybe endorse it, and Jane Goodall endorsed it, and Bill McKibben endorsed it. But I think my favorite um, quote was from a um, Drexel University researcher, a very esteemed researcher who, by the way, um, more or less single-handedly solved the problem of inner ear infections in children. But what he said is, um, my book was as macabre as a Stephen King horror novel, except it's true. Ticks are basically blanketing the globe. OK, so just for the basics, we know that ticks are in more places than they have ever been. And we have some archival data. We have old data in the um, scientific literature and new data. And this is just a little bit of it, you know, basically showing what happened in Sweden in a relatively short period of time from the early, 90, early 80s to the early 90s. Those little white dots are where ticks were found. And you can see the ticks moving up the um, east coast of, of Sweden. Sweden being one of many countries where this is happening. Um, so, you know, from 1943 to 83, basically, ticks didn't pass that. The line of demarcation was the 66th parallel of longitude. That's where they stayed, of latitude, rather. By 2011, we had a scientist do some more studies. We found them at the 69th parallel. They had moved about 200 miles further north. Now, this is happening in Canada. Canada is a new frontier for Lyme disease. Um, they are basically, the Canadians are, at the point where we were here in New York and in the Northeast and in the Midwest and other areas of the country, maybe 30 years ago. Doctors are uh, all of a sudden seeing Lyme disease, or they're saying, we don't have Lyme disease here, and not treating when they should. There's that whole awareness cycle that is starting up there as um, numbers of um, cases grow. In the last year, up 100% in Canada. Then there's this. You even find, and this may be a comment more on how just um, adaptable ticks are than on climate change itself. There's a place called Verhoinsk, Russia. It's above the Arctic Circle. It has the Guinness record for temperature extremes, about an extreme of 200 degrees from coldest to hottest on record. And there, a group of scientists went and decided to test the blood of some of the residents and found they were carrying the um, antibodies to Lyme disease. Maybe they weren't sick. They had been exposed. So we know that ticks are climbing latitudes. We see more cases in more places. We know we find ticks in more places. Well, they're doing something else. <laughs> and here, again, we have a, a very um, astute scientist uh, who decided in 1957 to climb an alp in um, 
what was then Czechoslovakia and uh, is now Slovenia. And he finds, okay, ticks cannot survive above 700 meters of altitude, okay? 50 years later, another scientist goes back, bless his heart, because I like this kind of data, and he finds ticks living happily at 1,100 meters. So they're not just moving north, they're moving up. How are they doing this, you ask? Well, um, basically a tick, and especially the black-legged tick that we are very concerned about because it gives us Lyme disease, um, walks one way. It walks vertically. It climbs up a bit of grass, a, a twig of some sort, and it holds out its forelegs, and it just waits for a mammal to pass by. Um, it, by the way, can smell your breath from 50 feet away. And that's when those little legs go out and they start waving, and hopefully they'll snag a bit of fur or a sock or what have you and climb on board. So they can't go far in and of themselves, even if they get on the back of a deer. You know, the deer stays in their geographical area for the most part. But what's happening is migratory birds are climbing um, latitudes, taking them further north, sometimes taking them further west to more hospitable places, to places they didn't survive before. Now, this has been happening for a very long time, that birds would pick up ticks, you know, from the tip of Argentina in South America all the way up to uh, the Yukon um, in the north. And they would pick them up in one place, drop them in another place. Well, a couple of things have happened. There are more ticks to be picked up, to hitch a ride on a, a, a passing bird. The other thing is, when that tick is picked up, say in Virginia, by a, a bird on the Atlantic flyway, and dropped maybe in Nova Scotia, that tick has a lot greater potential for survival. The conditions are right. It is not going to um, desiccate in the sun or freeze in the, in the um, snow or what have you. It's also going to have a much greater um, chance of finding other ticks, of finding the love of its life, of making babies 2,000 to 3,000 at a time, and propagating the species. So that's what happens. And this is happening in Europe. It's happening in many other places. So we have to, when we talk about the spread of uh, ticks, of course, talk about the spread of cases. So this is a, a map of cases, um, one dot per case from 1996. And basically, um, Lyme disease was more or less centered around the, the northeast and, and uh, the north, the coast, I guess, the, the mid-Atlantic coast. And so we fast forward to 2018, and we go from not so many to a lot more. I mean, in, in uh, the first map, there's hardly anything in western and central Pennsylvania, certainly in western and Pencil, uh, central New York. And by the second map, which is 2018, we're seeing a lot more cases of Lyme disease. And that's reflective of, case of uh, ticks moving north, ticks moving west. But there's something I have to tell you about, about the maps and about the way we count Lyme disease. So, that map purports to show about 30,000 cases of Lyme disease. That's about what we had in 2018. But you'll notice that, that Massachusetts doesn't seem to have any cases of Lyme disease, whatever. Um, there's a, just that kind of uh, rectangular block there. And basically, the CDC has said that it wasn't accepting Massachusetts numbers because it didn't like the way it was counting Lyme disease. It doesn't like the way New York State counts Lyme disease either because county health departments are so overwhelmed with Lyme disease cases that they extrapolate. They estimate how many cases we have. So there's a big difference between what the CDC puts out there and says we have in terms of cases and what we really have. So 
In 2018, CDC said we had about 36,000. Just those two states, Massachusetts and New York, the cases that were rejected, brings it more up to about 43,000 or so. Ah, but there's another qualifier here. And that is, a few years ago, the um, CDC did a study of insurance records. They wanted to see, see how many claims were filed for Lyme disease. And lo and behold, they found that there were a lot more claims for Lyme disease than they were recording in cases of Lyme disease. So they now say that there are 10 cases of Lyme disease for every one that's reported. So now we're multiplying this by 10. We are greater than 430,000, and we're probably more on the order of 500,000. Places like um, North Carolina, you can see that right, right there is North Carolina. It doesn't have many cases of Lyme disease. They recently did a study of insurance records, and North Carolina was fourth on the list of states in terms of the number of claims. So. We don't really have a handle on it, is the long and short of it. And numbers are important, as you'll find out later. Okay, we know that the climate has changed in New York. We've seen it in our own lifetimes. And these are some of the ways that climate has changed. It's up 2.4%, I mean 2.4 degrees, sorry, since 1970. We have these heavy rain events much more frequently, up 70%, including hurricanes. Sea level, up a foot since 1900. Spring actually begins earlier. Bees, birds, I love this one, and fish have changed. Off the coast of New York, stocks of fish, what ones there are left, are actually, actually moving north. They're, they are, you know, they stay in certain places, but they're further north. Just as ticks are moving north, so are our fish. Um, bees begin their business earlier. Birds are hatching in different places from where they did before. And by the way, <laughs> ticks are really happy. <laughs> there are many places for them to live, to thrive, um, many more places to to lay eggs and have babies. And this is another way that we can um, see the progression and the movement of ticks in New York, where we are right now. And what you'll see from this is that um, in the West, the Western New York, we saw a 500% a increase in Lyme disease cases in just a five year period. Central New York, about a 300% increase, a couple of hundred percent up the um, north of the Hudson Valley and in central and uh, uh, eastern New York. So this shows us something is going on, that ticks are moving north, that they're also moving west into more territory. What's also interesting about this, and we'll talk a little bit more about it later, is that Lyme disease in Long Island is actually going down. Something may be going on there that I want to tell you about. So we see this northward migration. They're expanding geographically. They're enjoying the outdoors longer. We talked about spring being a week early. Um, this means, in the scheme of things, that ticks go from one life stage to the next faster sometimes. They live about two years, but that's actually shortening because they can get to, from the, the, the first stage of life to the second, they have actually three stages, the larval, the nymphal, and the adult. So they have more opportunity to feed, to move to the next uh, stage in life. They call it accelerated phenology. And this is important because it means they get to their ultimate destination faster. They get to fulfill their life's mission and procreate. And this is sort of an example of what I'm talking about here. This is a picture of a fully engorged black-legged tick that was pulled off a dog on uh, New Year's Day of this year. 
These things are happening now. All you need is a little bit of balmy weather, maybe 40, 45 degrees. And if there's no snow or ice cover, a tick will just climb out of the leaf litter and climb up the nearest bit of grass, and maybe there'll be a passing dog, as there was in this case. Now, that tick might have died. This, you know, there's obviously a great mortality level among ticks, but instead, that tick had that last blood meal, um, had the opportunity to mate, and um, will go on, would have gone on if not captured by this pet owner. To, to lay eggs. So there's just more opportunities because it's warmer out. This epidemic is still unfolding. So here we have a um, piece of grass, and it looks like a nice little seed pod there with the red. Well, what that is are just hundreds of tiny baby ticks. And it's a new tick. It's called the Asian longhorned tick. It showed up in um, Hunterdon County in New Jersey in 2018, I, I'm thinking, yeah. And um, they tried very quickly to bring it under control because it was the first new species of tick to show up in the United States to be identified here in 50 years. Nobody knows where it came from, how it got here. Um, it lives in Asia, where it gives people so, a serious kind of um, uh, disease. Right now, it hasn't been shown to carry that here, but it may just be a matter of time. And it's more of a tick that uh, affects livestock. And it was found on sheep. There were a couple of thousand on this one sheep. So this is what happens when you brush up or a, a a sheep does, against that bit of grass. The ticks explode. They just jump on board. Another very unfortunate kind of tick we're seeing is called the winter tick. And it's taking a really serious toll on moose. Um, in just a couple of years, by 2030, there may be no moose left in the Midwest. And what's happening is these ticks uh, by the thousands are um, embedding themselves into um, moose. And those patches are, we call them ghost moose because there are so many ticks on these moose that they rub up against uh, a tree to try and get the, the um, ticks off of them and they lose their fur. Um, in New Hampshire, in Vermont, they have found moose with 150,000 ticks. And what happens is they bleed to death. About half their blood goes into the ticks. When a baby, tick, uh, baby moose is born, the, the uh, ticks move from the mother right to the baby. Um, so, um, all right. Now, the US government has not been known to be particularly um, aggressive in um, attacking climate change. Um, we seem to not be able to get a clear policy going. But in 2014, under a different administration, it did something very interesting. It came up with a list of four new things that it was going to look at to, to track the um, uh, progress of climate change in the United States. Was it getting worse? Was it getting better? So these are the four things that they were going to look at. New indicators of climate change. We were going to look at heating and cooling degree days, namely, is it getting warmer? Do we need more heat or do we need more air conditioning? They were going to look at wildfires. We have seen what is happening in Australia and in California in terms of wildfires driven by very um, hot spells when things are very dry. Great Lakes temperature, the Great Lakes hold 20% of the fresh water in the world. So that's an important place to look. And lastly, they were gonna track Lyme disease cases. Lyme disease is the only disease to be tracked in terms of the um, progress of climate change. So that's an interesting development. There was a, a couple of researchers by the name of Weiss and Mick Michael uh, who published in Nature Medicine a few years ago. The um, 
transitions in disease in human um, history. So we had that, that first transition when about 10,000 years ago we started farming and we started living in communal societies. And that's when measles and smallpox emerged. And then we had a second transition, uh, the centuries before and after Christ, when people started moving around and they started trading goods and spices and so forth. And with them, when they went from place to place, they didn't only bring those goods they were going to sell, they brought rats and fleas and lice and typhus. Now, in that third transition, we all sort of know about this. I think um, the quote from Charles Darwin says it, very well, wherever the European has trod, death seems to pursue the aboriginal. So in that third transition, we exported a lot of disease. Now we are in what we call the fourth transition. And planet Earth is a lot different. Um, it's smaller by virtue of the, our ability to move around it so quickly. We now have the Wuhan virus, the, the, new, the novel coronavirus, which started in China. We've been hearing about it for maybe a week, I mean a month to six weeks, and it's here in the United States. It's low in number, but it got here very quickly, and that's how. It's more crowded. It's much more developed. We have um, refugees moving around. It's unsettled in places, and yes, it's warmer. And the result of that is that we see there's um, a lot of emerging infectious disease events. And this shows the number of events decade to decade through 2000. So they're growing each and every decade. This one is a little bit of an aberration because it, ref it reflects the emergence of HIV which also caused a number of other emerging infectious disease events. But this, folks, is not a good trend. Many more illnesses are, are emerging. And, you know, when I say Lyme disease is the first, I say that because it's new. Yes, it was living quietly in the environment, um, but for the most part, nobody heard of Lyme disease before about 1980 or so. Um, it is climate driven. It's huge. You won't find anything on this scale among the other um, new uh, diseases that have been hatched because of climate change or enabled because of climate change. And that would include um, Zika virus and West Nile virus. Um, these are definitely, you know, new um, emerging uh, infectious disease events in themselves, but they're not as big as Lyme disease. And there's also, yes, more of the traditional diseases that we have known about for a long time, dengue and cholera and malaria especially. So these are, this is just a ser series of slides to bring home that point that this um, epidemic is very widespread. You'll, you'll find these signs at the entrance to parks in Paris. This is from the Netherlands, from Australia, where they haven't actually identified the bug that is causing a Lyme-like illness, and people are really fighting hard for recognition there. It's a very difficult situation there. In China, which is not known for being a terribly open society. This is what was written by a scientist who studied 800 residents of, uh, outside a uh, suburb of Beijing and found that there was a 5% rate of Lyme disease among these people. Under diagnosis of early Lyme disease and physical damage at an advanced stage are a huge problem. In Latin America, South America, we're also seeing it. But again, to bring home the, the uh, message that it's not just about Lyme disease. These are the total uh, counts, including other diseases like Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, like um, uh, anaplasmosis and ehrlichiosis and other such things. So that leads me to the 
the myths of Lyme disease. And I see I'm, I have 20 minutes left, so I'm going to um, speed up a little bit. Now, the chief myth is that we can diagnose Lyme disease. This is a bar chart, basically showing the performance of the Lyme disease test at various stages. And we can see very early on, even if you are infected, there's a very low chance, or too low a chance, that you will test positive. About 50% of people in the first weeks to maybe month or two of the um, infection will actually have Lyme disease, but they'll test negative. It's not a very good test, and we can't rely on it. Um, it cannot um, distinguish current from past infection, which may lead your doctor to say, oh, you already were infected. Even though this test is positive, I'm not going to treat you for Lyme disease. It's a false positive. There's been a lot of concern among doctors over false positives. And the reason is, you go to the scientific literature, you're going to find 30 papers on overdiagnosis of Lyme disease and five or six on underdiagnosis, which is really the, the mo more serious problem. This uh, quote that it's complex, technically demanding, difficult to interpret, that's from a government scientist. It's very arbitrary. It gets better, you'll see, by that chart later on, but that's based on studies that you really can't trust. A, a group of European scientists looked at 78 studies. They found there wasn't sufficient um, evidence to make inferences about the value of the tests. In other words, we can't say that they work. Here's one reason, among many, that this really matters. This is a 17-year-old boy. Um, from Dutchess County, who had gone away to summer camp, um, came home sick. He also came home really fired up to, to be a, an environmentalist and a natural scientist because it was an environmental camp. His parents took him to the pediatrician twice. He was tested for Lyme disease. He tested negative, wrongly. The Lyme disease spirochete went to his heart. It, it caused Lyme carditis, or a uh, heart block, basically, and he died. This is a uh, quote from a, a lawsuit in which his pediatrician is asking, what's the significance to you of the fact that the antibody test was negative? The doctor replies that he didn't have Lyme at the time. This is what doctors believe, at least some of them. Now, they say this kind of situation is rare. And um, that in all, when I wrote this story, in all of the medical literature, there had only been reported four cases of Lyme carditis. Guess what? Five months later, there's another death in Dutchess County. Nobody's looking for this kind of thing. They also tell us, OK, you have the rash. So if you don't test positive early on, you'll get the rash. The rash is called a bullseye rash. In about 9% of cases, it's actually a bullseye, this central clearing with the red on the outside. So it often can be missed. You sometimes don't get it either. Best case, 70 to 80% of people do get the rash. So it's, again, this um, pa paradigm on which Lyme diagnosis and treatment um, rest is flawed. And this is some of the ways in which it's flawed. Now, I told you about Borrelia burgdorferi. It's a pretty nasty organism. And it's been around a long time. And it has learned how to survive. It is a champion survivor. The first thing it does is it does that little drilling deal. It disseminates throughout your body goes to your, your lymph nodes, and it disables germinal centers. These are things that your lymph nodes need to um, fight off infection. We've found this in um, mice, and we found this in monkeys, and there's every reason to believe it's happening in people. 
it also changes itself. It's got these outer surface proteins, they're called. And your immune system looks at them and says, okay, I gotcha, I'm gonna start attacking that thing. And then it, sh it sheds those proteins and it takes on another look and your immune system is like, what? What's going on? It also, when it's under environmental stress, namely our uh, immune system is attacking it or antibiotics are attacking it, it does these things. It changes shape. It goes dormant, goes under these things called biofilms. And it just hangs out there until the coast is clear. It persists. Borrelia is a really, really interesting microorganism. This was told to me by a University of California scientist. It has a huge brain. It outsmarts people. Um, so now I'm going to go through, we can cure Lyme disease, and then I'm going to take some questions. Now, it has been said for a long time that a short course of antibiotics is all that is need, needed say 10 to 28 days, and that spirochete is killed in your body. Um, so this is a, a recent study that sort of reaffirms that. Um, this guy, Dr. Gary Wormser, who is a leading um, champion of Lyme disease dogma, um, took patients and gave them 14 days of amoxicillin because they had Lyme rash. He knew they had Lyme disease. He found it to be highly effective and well tolerated, uniformly successful in resolving the rash. No patient, Dr. Wormser writes, developed an objective manifestation of Lyme disease. Remember that word, objective. And yet, <laughs> There was evidence of what we call post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome in nearly 17% of these 24 people. In other words, they stayed sick. And you know, for, for years and years, it's been in the medical literature, 10 to 20% of people, this is from the CDC, treated with two to four weeks of antibiotics will have lingering symptoms. That amounts to 42 to 84,000 people in 2017. There was one study that found 15 years later, 5% of those people would still be sick. So compound those numbers year after year. And then consider this is among people who are treated early, who have the best opportunity and hope to get better, the best chance. People who are treated later, the numbers are much higher in terms of them still suffering. So a little bit about these people who continue to suffer, life after Lyme. One scientist at, the, at Columbia University likened it to congestive heart fail, failure. That's the kind of quality of life of some people with post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome, whatever that is. Another study of 63 patients found them with all sorts of you know, neurocognitive problems. Namely, I, I can't remember things, I have brain fog, I also have um, uh, task problems, problems doing um, normal things every day, um, problems making my body move the way it should move, fatigue, sleep disturbance, a lot of pain. And this may help um, explain why. On the left, we have the brains of normal people. On the right, we have brains of people who are suffering from post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome. And basically what we're seeing, and this is a pretty new study from Johns Hopkins, it's massive inflammation in people's heads. So a lot of those other you know, things, the fatigue, the sleeplessness, I can't remember things, those are the subjective system, uh, symptoms that have long been dismissed and why this disease hasn't gotten the attention it deserves. Um, this is just sort of a, a summary of some of the problems that uh, persist with um, Lyme disease. And I think I'll end it here so we can talk a little bit. We have based Lyme disease care um, and our, our hesitance, so to speak, to um, 
doing longer courses of Lyme disease, of uh, antibiotics, based on about four clinical trials. In other words, we've taken people who have lingering Lyme disease in four different um, experiments, and we've given them three months of antibiotics. First of all, that's not enough um, studies to really mean anything. And there have been criticisms of those studies. They didn't have enough people involved. They um, minimized the positive effects, and they expected much more improvement. In other words, in one of the studies, you had to be a whole standard deviation better uh, in terms of your functioning than the general population to be counted as a success story. Further, they did the same thing over and over, three months of a combination of oral and um, uh, intravenous antibiotics. If it didn't work the first time, we got to try something else. But instead, there's been this cheerleading going on. See, it's not a chronic illness. This didn't work in these cases. OK. And the problem here shows why we're in this situation. Compared to other illnesses, we have had very, very little study of what works for people with Lyme disease. You can see at the bottom there, Lyme disease has very, very few studies. HIV AIDS, more than 600. We haven't done the work on Lyme disease. We have a lot more to do to figure out why people stay sick, how to make them better. And we have to recognize that people stay sick and it's not something that's in their heads. And we're starting to document that with studies like those brain scans, with other studies that are going on now about the persistence in animals. Um, and we're moving in the right direction. Um, a couple of weeks ago, a bill passed in Congress to provide $150 million for tick-borne illnesses. That's huge. Um, that's more money than we've seen in a very long time. But we have a lot more to do.